This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. As you know, Audible is the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks. I'm going to skip all the normal details and just get right to it because I'm very excited about this recommendation. Finally, it's taken years, but Jeff Shara's uh, World War II series is all on Audible, and you can get them unabridged for free by signing up for a free 30-day trial. Uh, For the longest time, they were two-credit books, which in the long run meant you couldn't get them for free, but now they're all one credits. You should definitely check them out. I've listened to every single one, and they're amazing. And the reader takes his writing and just takes it to a whole nother level with his ability with accents and voices. He does a great job. Uh, The first book is called The Rising Tide. The second one is The Steel Wave. The third one is No Lesson Victory. And the fourth one is The Final Storm. Trust me, you want to hear these books. They're amazing. He does a lot of uh, detailed research and and he's used a lot of diaries and journals. So he gets into the conversations that the commanders had. But at the same time, he also does a good job of showing you what the what the average person, you know, the, the uh, person in the tank or the person carrying a gun, what their life was like. All four of these books are amazing. You will love them, and you can get them for free. So please check it out by Jeff Shara. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 70, The Battle of of Taranto, Part 1. The decision by the British to defend Malta, despite its proximity to Italy, meant that the island, its people, and the military personnel there would be bombed almost daily for the foreseeable future. But it also meant that, if it could be held, that Admiral Andrew Cunningham, commander of the Mediterranean fleet, would have a chance of success at his main responsibility keeping the sea lanes open from Gibraltar to the Suez. And Malta, almost dead center of that 1,600-mile passage between the two points, meant that the island status went from indefensible to indispensable. Cunningham already knew all of this. He knew the Mediterranean. After all, as the former commander of the destroyer flotillas in the Mediterranean from 1933 to 37. He knew that sea better than most. During that same time, as Mussolini pushed for an expansion of the Italian fleet, Cunningham attempted to keep pace as he pushed for fleet readiness, and in particular, focused on night torpedo attacks. Then, in 1937, Admiral Sir Geoffrey Blake suffered his second heart attack, and Cunningham was promoted, now second-in-command of the Mediterranean fleet along with command of the battlecruiser squadron there. The HMS Hood was now his flagship. This workload would have probably sunk most men, but Cunningham was a natural. In August of 1938, he was ordered to London as the new Deputy Chief of Naval Staff. He protested, saying his talent for paperwork was lacking. But honestly, he just missed the blue water. But the Board of Admiralty thought highly of him, and, as Deputy Sea Lord, did the actual work of his superior. Then, the first Sea Lord, Sir Roger Backhouse, died. Another was put in his place, and Cunningham, gratefully relieved, took over command of the Mediterranean fleet. But, with hindsight, his time in London can now be seen as additional experience for what was coming battling for the Mediterranean and occasionally against Churchill, when his ideas outstripped the abilities of the fleet in the Mediterranean. By June 1939, Cunningham was happily back at sea, now as the commander of the Mediterranean fleet. His admiral's flag was atop the battleship HMS Warspite. Yes, he was excited, but also concerned. The British Empire had for decades like so many other countries, cut back on military funding. Some of this was from leaders like Chamberlain, who hoped to appease Hitler by appearing non-threatening. Another major factor was that most industrialized countries were still recovering from the effects of the Great Depression. Still, Cunningham had loyal men under him who knew what they were doing. The Admiral bellowed 
and drove his men, but knew they were the key to his success. Cunningham, also known by his nickname ABC, also knew it would take time to rebuild his fleet, but that was time he didn't have. A year into his command, the war was underway, and the Allies had known mostly defeat. Poland's fall was followed by others, and, shockingly, France also fell quickly. Dunkirk was the one painful saving grace, as a third of a million men made it home without their weapons. Soon, the bombing over the UK started, and then the Italians crossed into Egypt. As in most military campaigns, the British Mediterranean fleet would have to make do. And Cunningham probably smiled less than most when he heard about the Italians' defeat in trying to take a piece of the French carcass. Mussolini's soldiers might have bungled their glorious entry into the war, but now they were in the war. And now ABC had to consider the Italian fleet. Because surely the Italians would be considering him and his. Mussolini had crowed for years Italy's intention to be the master of our sea. So it would be battle. A battle Cunningham intended to pursue until the Italian fleet was cleared from the Mediterranean. But the battle that could achieve this could also render the British fleet ineffectual. And the Admiral had to consider the Germans as well. Still, the time to hit the Italians was obvious when in port. The place was equally obvious. Taranto, the most significant port close to Malta. But how should it be done? A land invasion was impossible. A naval bombardment was out as well. If the British fleet came that close to the Italian coast, every Italian vessel, especially their motor torpedo boats, as well as their torpedo aircraft, would wreak havoc on Cunningham's smaller fleet. But what about the Royal Air Force? Perhaps they could wreak havoc of their own. Unfortunately, there were no British-controlled airfields close enough. And as for a sub-attack, Cunningham knew the waters of Taranto were too shallow. Distilling down this information and these choices, the Admiral was left with one option, an attack by planes from a carrier. Taranto is a port in southern Italy in the Arch of the Boot. Founded in 706 BC as a Spartan Greek trading post, its natural features makes it an almost flawless harbor. Still, the inhabitants over the centuries improved it by adding breakwaters and intricate docking facilities. Because of its location and size that allows it to hold a number of ships, its existence posed a threat to the British. It held most of the Italian fleet, which threatened the Suez, the pathway to India, Australia, and Singapore. Also, the British maintaining control of the canal kept the access from the oil in the Persian Gulf. Cunningham had the beginnings of a plan, but knew any attack, no matter how clever, would not be easy. They had to approach the enemy's mainland, get past dozens of reconnaissance planes, the guns of 54 warships, 21 shore batteries of 4-inch guns, as well as other batteries of rapid-fire guns, all the while dodging the steel cables of 60 anti-aircraft barrage balloons. If this layered defense could be run, there was a good chance the attackers would still not make it home. Taranto always had several squadrons of fighter planes in place. Risking one life is one thing. Throwing it away was something else. And Taranto also boasted impressive passive defenses. Giant chains, mines, and anti-submarine nets. Still, as dangerous as this was, there had been successful air attacks previously. In August of that year, the British attacked four Italian naval vessels in Bomba Harbor on the Libyan coast. Within minutes, three swordfish biplanes torpedoed and sank the Italian ships. No surface vessels were involved. But Taranto was an altogether different operation being considered. Its many layered defenses and quantity of ships 
put this strike in a class all by itself. Yes, Taranto was the place to attack. It posed problems for the Allies, just as Malta did for the Axis. But as Cunningham and his staff studied the details, the odds remained against them. The Italian port was the main base for a larger and more modern fleet. Due to its location, it had no supply problems. Its anchorage of three miles across was well protected. And then there was the inner harbor with up-to-date docking, repair, and aviation facilities, all fortified with anti-aircraft batteries, searchlights, and listening devices. How were they to get in, destroy the numerous targets, while getting most of their own out? By plane, yes, but which ones, and how many to use? Actually, the first question was answered for them. The fleet air arm available to Cunningham only had an adequate number of one type of plane, the fairy swordfish. The swordfish, or string bag, as it was called, due to its webbing of stainless steel rods and struts located between the upper and lower wings, was a compromised plane by putting together the specifications of an earlier fairy flycatcher fighter and a fairy Gordon torpedo bomber. Uniquely, the string bag worked in that it did several functions dive bomber, mine layer, reconnaissance, spotter, and torpedo plane rather well. Success for weaponry normally calls for specialization. The string bag was fitted with the Pegasus 111 M3 engine, which turned a three-bladed metal propeller. This 690-horsepower engine, when it carried its two or three occupants, had a top speed of only 134 knots but it also had renowned reliability. In fact, the stream bag's final version, the TSR-11, was so reliable that it was forbidden as a training aircraft. The fact that it was hard to stall, easily recovered when it did, could land at a slow speed and take off in a short distance would lead a novice to think that the aircraft was practically flying itself. Thus, new pilots did not have to struggle and learn to react when mistakes were made. As a part of its compromised design, besides the carrier deck arresting gear, the string bag's bomb rack could carry either a 1,610-pound torpedo, three 500-pound bombs, or a long-range tank. Still, this biplane was obsolete before the war started. But, like his fleet, this is what Cunningham had to work with against the Italians. But besides the already mentioned defenses of the Italians, there was another defensive measure, this one attached to the very ships being targeted. In the two decades before the war, the Italians had the good fortune to have an engineer named Pugliese as one of their leading design engineers, and he created an effective defense against a ship's greatest threat, the torpedo. Pugliese created a protective barrier really a bulge in the hull of a ship, running most of its length under the waterline. Within the bulge was a cylinder of air, three feet in diameter. Normally, when a torpedo hits a ship and explodes, it creates a sphere of superheated high-pressure gas. An area of water is formed, and its weight is directed towards the ship, thus increasing and directing the pressure and punching power of the water. Literally, a hole is ripped into the hole, and the water does the rest. But now, with the Pugliese bulge, the container protecting the hole would take the balance of the damage. The Italians had one more advantage going into this war. Even before Mussolini joined Hitler's side, Italy had been reading British radio messages. The British were doing the same to them. But Prudence still demanded that the Regi Aeronautica send up surveillance craft to locate enemy ships. But honestly, more information was gathered by reading Britain's mail. Equally impressive was the communication abilities of the Supermarina in Rome, as it could handle numerous outgoing and incoming communications simultaneously. In other words, the Italians had information and the ability to act on it in an organized way with more ships. London would have been keen to have such a communication center, 
but they had learned a long time ago that in battle, ships and men are lost. Those losses had to be filled, and the battle had to go on. And in the end, it came down to a captain and his crew to win the day by engaging the enemy. And Cunningham was eager to engage the enemy. He believed in himself and his captains. However, he was a realist. In July of 1940, he had in the eastern Mediterranean five battleships, the Warspite, Barum, Ramillies, Royal Sovereign, and Malaya. But there were caveats. The Malaya's condenser regularly malfunctioned, which meant the engine's performance was unreliable. The Barum's guns couldn't be counted on, accuracy-wise, when trying to match the range of the Italians. Ramillies and Royal Sovereign had boilers that regularly underperformed. Also, his seven cruisers had smaller guns with shorter ranges than the enemy. Next, the Egyptian dock workers would run for shelter at the slightest possibility of a raid, and often staying undercover the next day as well, just in case. Another weakness was at Suez. The cruisers there each had only about 110 shells enough for a few minutes of fire. And with his fleet was the carrier HMS Eagle, already obsolete, with hardly any armor on its flight deck. The rest of his assets were made up of 20 destroyers and 12 outdated subs. The addition of Force H under James Somerville, stationed in the western Mediterranean, helped, but that didn't reduce the number of Italian ships. That could only be done by battle. And the key to the upcoming battle was Malta. Malta was a harbor, fortress, airbase, supply depot, and reconnaissance outpost. And the first step for Cunningham in planning a raid against Taranto was reconnaissance. Before September of that year, his reconnaissance aircraft consisted of short Sunderlands, in essence, huge, slow flying boats. Although relatively modern, they first took to the skies in 1937, they were not a reconnaissance pilot's dream aircraft. Their wingspan was 112 feet long, and their tail fins were 32 feet above the keel. Not exactly a small craft. Its cruising speed was 160 knots, with a range of 1,780 miles. And Taranto might only be 360 miles away from Malta, in a straight line. But that line went over Sicily and the toe of the Italian boot. So the flight path had to be more to the east, which meant more time in the air to be shot at. Lastly, its four Pegasus 22 1,010 horsepower engines could be heard 20 miles away. Not surprisingly, their sorties to and from trying to photograph Taranto were filled with faster Italian fighters making life hell. Clearly, something faster, smaller, and quieter was needed. The answer, unexpectedly, came from the United States. Glenn Martin, originally a partner of Wilbur and Orville Wright, formed his own company in 1917. Of his different designs, his aircraft, codenamed Type 167, was about to change the war in the Mediterranean. The 167 was rejected by the U.S. Army Air Corps, but it was soon offered up to other countries. In January 1939, the French Air Force ordered hundreds of them, preferring to call the plane the Glen. 215 Glens were in France when the country fell to Nazi Germany. During that six-week war, the U.S. aircraft won the admiration of the French. After the armistice, the remaining 225 Glens were sent to Britain, still in their crates. They were assembled on the home island, and most were sent to the Middle East. Hey everyone, Ray here. History is replete with humans overcoming adversity. Yet one of the most horrific disasters, and those that it affected, has largely been forgotten. That being the Great Mississippi Flood. From Wondery, American History Tellers is a podcast that explores extraordinary events from our nation's past and brings them to life. And the story of the Great Mississippi Flood launches their new season. 
In the summer of 1926, the American Midwest experienced rainfall like no one could remember. And all that water had to go somewhere, that being the mighty Mississippi. By the time the rain stopped, some 27,000 square miles were underwater. Crops were destroyed, getting around was practically impossible, and hundreds of farms and entire communities had been washed away. This included now 600,000 homeless Americans and another 1,000 dead. And when you add on the racism, exploitation, and betrayal that followed, the American landscape would be changed forever. Listen to American History Tellers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen one week early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Before being sent out, the Glen Martin was evaluated by Flight Lieutenant E.A. Titch Whiteley. There were obvious flaws, as in the fuel tanks were in the wings, and the tanks themselves had no self-sealing features. One bullet and that would be the end of the plane and pilot. But overall, Whiteley liked what he saw. The Marilyn Mark I, known officially by the RAF as a Martin Marilyn, had two right 950 horsepower engines with a max speed of 251 knots and a ceiling of 28,500 feet. Its fuel silage was made up of riveted aluminum and its 47 feet length held a crew of three, a pilot, bombardier, and gunner. It had four fixed wing guns, as well as an upper and lower rear-facing gun. With a full load of bombs, its range was just over 1,000 miles. But what impressed Titch the most was that, at certain altitudes, this U.S. bomber could outrun a hurricane. Two weeks after his positive report on the Martin, Maryland, Whiteley was ordered to fly a crew of three of them to Malta. They were to serve as the island's reconnaissance aircraft. Titch's order called the aircraft Martin Marilyn, but the RAF pilots, with their usual flair for nicknames, christened it the Bob Martin, named strangely after a widely known dog condition powder by Dr. Robert Martin. Given the plane's speed and Cunningham's needs, it was decided to fly the aircraft straight over Nazi-occupied France and fascist-controlled Sardinia. The crews took off at night and safely passed over dangerous areas even before they were noticed. Upon landing, they handed over rolls of film they shot on the flight over. Now stationed on Malta, the three Glens formed the Unit 431 flight and were operational on September 6, 1940 stationed on the Lucca airfield. They soon started flying all over the Mediterranean, even as far north as Naples. They photographed and logged the movements of the Italian fleet, who spent most of their time in port at Taranto. Malta could only stay in British hands as long as it received supplies from Gibraltar, which meant the convoys had to get through, which meant the Royal Navy needed to know where the Italian ships were, when a convoy was scheduled to come east. This meant that the Bob Martin, or Glen Martin, as Churchill called it, had to gather that information. Because there were only three of them, Cunningham and a personal communique made it clear that the Glens were not allowed, under any circumstances, to engage the enemy. Their sole duty was reconnaissance. The one pilot who did engage and take out a Khan Z-506 reconnaissance plane was reprimanded. The first mission for Whiteley and his Glens was on September 8th, two days after they arrived. They came back from Tripoli with clear pictures of the harbor. They flew over Taranto for the first time a week later. Soon rolls of film of Mediterranean harbors and Italian fleets were in British hands. But no one on Malta was trained to interpret what was on the film. The Royal Air Force Middle East Command had someone in Cairo who could interpret, and the Glen's photos were sent there. But that wasn't a solution. Everyone knew Cunningham's sense of urgency and expectations. Soon after, a reconnaissance flight over Taranto on October 27th was analyzed by a Lieutenant David Pollock, who had been given a crash course in photo interpretation. 
He may not have been the best, but he didn't have to be. The pictures clearly showed five battleships, three heavy cruisers, six light cruisers, and numerous destroyers, all in port. In summation, enough naval tonnage to block any convoy from reaching Malta or the eastern Mediterranean. Meanwhile, the Italians kept a fighter presence over Malta, Taranto, and other Italian ports, but the speed of the glens made it almost impossible to catch up and engage. Still, the Italian fighters tried. On November 2nd, a glen was attacked by three Italian CR-42 fighters. They managed a single bullet through an instrument panel, but that was all. On the 7th, during another pass over Taranto, a glen was set upon by seven MC-200s. But the glen's speed simply allowed it to stay in front of the attackers all the way home. Because of the Glen Martins, the British knew what was where at Taranto. However, because of the Glen Martins, the Italians knew an attack was imminent. But the plan to attack Taranto was a typical Cunningham plan. Complex, multi-layered, and full of feints, while serving numerous needs. Quoting Thomas P. Lowry and John Wellham, the latter actually participating in the attack from their book, the attack on Taranto, quote, In spite of the plan's complexities, all ships arrived as scheduled, and because of its complexities, the Italians were deeply confused. Unquote. On November 11th, Mussolini had chosen a new commander for the Greek campaign. He then bought himself more time with Hitler by offering up one excuse after the other. Now, he just needed things to settle down. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Yes, I just found out it's pronounced Taranto, not Taranto, from a listener who is married to someone, I'm sure she's a lovely lady, from Italy. So thank you very much for correcting me on that. I just wanted to share with you a couple things before I go and start writing uh, episode 71, uh, the tour. Yes, it's looking very good. I've been in contact with the rep there. We're going back and forth trying to make a, a slightly smaller package, and we'll see what happens. As soon as I have the details, you know I will get them out to you. Um, thank you to everyone so far who sent in emails showing an interest. As soon as um, the information is available, I will get it to you. And so anyone else who's interested, please just send me an email to ray at worldwar2podcast.net. I'll add your name to the list. Um, but it's looking very good, and hopefully it's going to happen this year, and I'll get a chance to come and see some of these amazing places. Um, the membership. Yes, it is finally up and running. You can check out the details on the uh, website, worldwar2podcast.net. Thank you for those who have already signed up to support the show. I really do appreciate it. I hope you enjoy episode one. Um, obviously, thank you to Paul Finch, who designed the website and the membership. Thank you, Paul. Um, and for those of you who are thinking about signing up um, just to have more episodes, let me give you an idea of what we're covering so far. Um, the first two episodes covers the beginning of a family named Krupp. They live in Essen in Western Germany, and over time, they will become Germany's greatest armament manufacturer. And around the time of the Franco-Prussian War, their success and their interests are tied with the national government. Now, that's rather ordinary. There's nothing new about that. Many companies, especially arms makers, rise and fall with their governments. But the Krupps become very large, probably the largest company in Germany, and they have some serious choices to make once the Nazis come to power. Now, the Krupps, uh, I should say the main Krupp, because it's a privately owned company and it's always run by the oldest male in the family line, um, they have to decide after they support the Nazis and they get into power, um, they're thinking that they pretty much bought and paid for Hitler and that they're going to control him and they're going to use him to uh, wipe out liberalism and the unions in Germany. But they quickly find out who's the boss. So now they have to decide if they're going to toe the line with the government's new many varied programs, especially when the uh, political prisoner camps start and then later war prison camps start and, of course, the concentration camps. Um, are they going to resist this? Are they going to use their power and their money influence? Are they going to toe the line? They have some very um, tough choices to make. 
Now, this is a long story with lots of details, because the Allied Army was able to get into Essen relatively quickly and capture tons of paperwork. But it's a fascinating story, and you get a glimpse into the upper echelons of how the Nazi power structure worked. In some circles, money was everything. In others, it was meaningless, as one was judged by their loyalty to Nazism. Now, this story is going to take many episodes to tell, so what I'll do is I'll bring in other stories just to break it up from time to time. In March, uh, the two membership episodes will cover the amazing story of Billy Mitchell as he tries to wake up the U.S. to the power and, frankly, dangers of air power, notably Japanese growing air strength. Without giving too much away, his is a doomed fate, but he tries, and although he is vindicated, that vindication comes only when Pearl Harbor is attacked by Japanese air power. So I'll throw in different things from time to time. I'll come back to the Krups every once in a while because it's a very long story, but I think you'll like it. So what I'm trying to do is just give you something, give you your money's worth, something different, something other than just a blow-by-blow of World War II. And I hope after you listen to the membership episodes, you'll be saying, oh, I didn't know that. So I hope you members enjoy it. And let me know if there's something in particular you would like to hear. Membership has its privileges. So I'd like to thank the following members. Chad, Alan, Rob, Andrew, Mark, William, Paul, another Andrew, Bradley, Brian, Karen, Don, and Mark. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the episodes. And lastly, I would like to thank Dustin H. from South Lake Tahoe, California for his donation. Thank you very much. And I will see you as soon as I can with the actual battle of Taranto. Take care, everyone.